Welcome to the Kansas City Sports History Podcast. My name is Matt Starr, and I'm your host. Today, our guest is Jeff Montgomery, who played with the Kansas City Royals from 1988 to 1999. Jeff, do you have any opening remarks for the Kansas City Sports History Group before we begin with questions? Well, I'm honored to be considered for this opportunity to share a little bit of my experience as a both a Royal, a Royal alum, and now a Royals broadcaster. Great. Well, tell us about where you grew up, your high school, and what athletic experiences you had in school, and what sports you participated in. I grew up in a small town in southern Ohio, Wellston, Ohio. It's in Jackson County. It's a town of like five to 6,000 people, kind of in the middle of nowhere. People ask me where I'm from. I tell them, I say, what's it close? And I say, it's not close to really anything. Uh, I'm south of Columbus, east of Cincinnati. Uh, grew up in the same house. Uh, you know, my same parents, brother and sister, played sports all the time. Uh, that was kind of more in the days of football, basketball, baseball. Uh, I never heard of soccer, never heard of hockey. Uh, so I didn't really have a chance to experience a lot until I went to college. But uh, I was real serious. Uh, whatever season it was, I was serious. I was a better baseball player uh, than football, baseball in college. I needed a scholarship in football is, um, you know, in the fall. So being a small guy, 150 pounds at the time, uh, I decided to wait till the spring of my senior year in high school to see if any baseball opportunities presented themselves. And fortunately, uh, they did. I uh, was given a scholarship to go to Marshall University. Uh, went to Marshall for three seasons, and after my junior year, I was drafted by the Cincinnati Reds, my hometown team. I grew up following Reds baseball. Uh, listen to Reds games on the radio almost every night. Marty Brenneman and Joe Nuxall and uh, back in the glory days, the Big Red Machine. Okay, all right. Uh, who were your sports heroes when you were growing up? Pete Rose. Okay, all right. Pete Rose was my hero. I styled my play of uh, really in all sports after Pete Rose's hustle and I uh, really truly admired the way he overachieved and got probably more out of his ability and athleticism than most any athlete I can think of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, uh, you attended Marshall University. Uh, tell us what you excelled at in college, and did you play any other sports there? No, I just played baseball in college. Um, I was actually recruited uh, both as a shortstop and pitcher. Our shortstop my freshman year was a fifth-year senior, and he was a all-conference type player, so I wasn't going to get much playing time. So. Uh, we decided that I was going to be a pitcher, and fortunately, I got off to a really good start my freshman year. I won Southern Conference uh, Rookie Pitcher of the Year, and uh, really kind of set the stage for me as a pitcher at the college level. And I uh, was fortunate to have the opportunity to play three years, and uh, and then drafted after my junior season by the Cincinnati Reds. Okay, all right. Yeah, you were drafted by the Reds in the ninth round of 1983 amateur draft. Tell us about the experience of being drafted. Well, it was very unusual because my junior season at Marshall, I was very mediocre. Had a five win, five loss, five ER season. Wasn't really spectacular. However, the last two games that I pitched during my junior season were against Ohio University and the University of Kentucky. And both of those teams had uh, players who were prospects to be drafted and the scouts had shown up to watch them play. Fortunately, I threw two really good games, two of my best games of that season. Uh, during those two games and the rest is history about a month later I was uh, drafted by the Reds in the ninth round I was playing golf with my dad at uh, Fair Greens Country Club back in Jackson Ohio and I saw my mom and my sister uh, up on the side of the road on one of the golf holes and uh, they were waving their arms and we went over and what's wrong what's happening and they presented me with a telegram and it was a telegram informing me that the Cincinnati Reds had selected me in the ninth round. Wow very cool. So you made your Major League debate debut on August 1st, 1987, at the age of 25. Tell us about your first game in a year in professional baseball. Well, it was really the most memorable day of my baseball career. And I was fortunate to play over 12 seasons in the Major Leagues and uh, you know put together a nice resume as far as my accomplishments on the field as a player. But I'll never forget that first day that I put on a Major League uniform because it was in Cincinnati. Uh, it was at Riverfront Stadium. It was where I grew up watching Major League Baseball. And it was for the team that I really truly dreamed of playing for someday. And my manager was my favorite player of all time, Pete Rose. So it was a very, very oh, yeah. uh, memorable day for me. And uh, even though it's only one day, uh, it takes literally decades to accomplish the opportunity 
to play Major League Baseball. And all of those days on the you know hot playground, getting extra ground balls, and taking extra brad- batting practice from my dad, and you know all the work uh, finally had paid off with an opportunity to play in the big leagues. And uh, you know when you're not a oversized guy with tremendous ability, you have to knock down the door a few more times and beat a little harder on that door to get an opportunity. And when I was able to put on that uniform for the first time, uh, very, very uh, rewarding for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you were traded by the Cincinnati Reds on February 15th, 1988, to the Kansas City Royals for Van Snyder. Tell us about that trade and who was instrumental in getting you to the Royals? Well, I'd played in the minor leagues against some of the Royals uh, affiliates, particularly against the Omaha Royals. And their manager was Frank Funk. And Frank Funk asked me after my uh, season, which would have been the 86th season in Denver, uh, I pitched for the Denver Zephyrs that year in AAA ball, and Frank had, was managing the Omaha Royals, and he asked me if I'd play winter ball for him in Puerto Rico. And I said I, I, I would check with my wife. We're going to have a baby any time, but it, you know, if, if it's all, all, all good with her, I'd love to do it. And so I go to Puerto Rico and played baseball for Frank Funk uh, that winter, and that was very instrumental in my eventually getting traded to the Royals because that season I made my debut with the Reds. I didn't pitch, I think, 10 or 12 games and didn't get a lot of work, and I didn't feel confident about playing in the major leagues for the Reds. And uh, it was certainly a fresh opportunity, and uh, you know, I get to the Royals, and they decided to really kind of transition me back into the relief role that I pitched earlier in my minor league career in and uh, that was uh, probably the biggest factor of all in me getting uh, an opportunity to pitch for the Royals is making that transition into the bullpen and, and, and having Frank Funk be my manager in Puerto Rico. Okay. What were your favorite cities and least favorite cities to play in? Love playing in Baltimore. Uh, my favorite city to play in and, and a favorite ballpark is Kauffman Stadium here in yeah. Kansas City but on the road, Baltimore is probably my favorite place to go as far as playing. My favorite city to go to was Chicago. And just a lot of good things about both of those cities that uh, were very attractive. You know, Baltimore with our new ballpark they built in 92. Uh, had fond memories from uh, that ballpark. Played in the All-Star game there in 1993. Uh, Chicago, not as much the ballpark and not as much the baseball experience, but just the the, the city life of going to Chicago, a great city to you know spend three or four days yeah. in in the middle of the summer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, who are your favorite catchers for the Kansas City Royals? Uh, Mike McFarland would be at the top of the list. He was a guy that uh, seemed to really get a lot out of me. Uh, but Brent Maine was another guy that I, I felt really comfortable with. Had an opportunity to pitch to Bob Boone a little bit early in my career uh, here as a Royal. And Bob Boone probably uh, as... I don't know, probably as important to me developing as a, a young pitcher trying to establish myself in the major leagues, uh, showed a lot of confidence in the type of style that I should be demonstrating on the mound and um, taught me that I didn't have to throw to a, a real small target, just keep the ball down in the strike zone, quality strikes down in the strike zone, you're going to be okay, and sure enough, that played out uh, exactly the way he had told me. Yeah, great. Well, on June 8th, 1988, you pitched in relief for Brett Saberhagen and recorded your first Major League save in a 5-4 to four Royals win over the Oakland A's at Royal Stadium. Tell us about that moment. What I remember most is I came in to face Dave Henderson and he hit a ground ball for a double play. And I don't know if that ended the game or I don't know if that got us out of the inning, but uh, I was a closer in Omaha for that first couple of months of that, uh, I guess, 88 season and uh, had done really well in Omaha as a closer. And I was called up and they indicated I was going to you know, move right into that role because the Royals had Dan Quisenberry and Gene Garber as their closers that season, and uh, the Royals got off to a slow start. The two of them had struggled at different points during the course of the early part of the '88 season, and I, you know, I come up and I think my debut, I get a save, and you know, I'm thinking I'm going to be the closer, and I never, never got another save opportunity the rest of the season. And uh, a year or so later, Steve Farr, who actually became the closer. Uh, the rest of that 88 season told me that the reason was that he had gone into John Wathen, who was managing, and, and told the Duke that he felt like, you know, this Montgomery guy coming up, you know, there's no reason uh, uh, for, for me to go to the front of the line. I should be setting him up because he had set Dan Quisenberry up for a number of years, and he deserved the opportunity. And sure enough, they bought in, and Steve Farr, the beast, he did a great job in, in closing games. And though his injury, I believe in the middle of the 89 season, had knee surgery, that's when I was given an opportunity to start closing again. All right. Okay. 
Well, here's a real Kansas City historic moment. You pitched an immaculate inning on April 29th, 1990, 1990 when you struck out three batters on nine pitches in the eighth inning with a 5-2 to two win over the Texas Rangers. Tell us about that absolutely incredible moment. Well, I remember, and I don't know if it was the last batter I faced, but for sure one of the batters I faced was Pete Incavilia. Mm-hmm. And he was a, a hitter that was a big, strong power hitter. And I, I remember I threw him a first pitch slider, and he swings and misses. And then I threw a fastball about chest high, neck high, and he swings through it. And the catcher calls for another high fastball, and I throw another high fastball, and he swings through it. So I really didn't throw nine strikes, but I got nine strikes as a result of the, the hitters chasing okay. pitches out of the strike <laughs> zone. So I come off the field, and uh, somebody indicated that, hey, you just tied a major league record for striking out the side on nine pitches. And I said, yeah, me and a 1,000 others. And I uh, didn't think it was that rare. Then maybe a week or two later, I saw in Sports Illustrated where um, Tim Churchin had written a, a little article on, the, on that immaculate inning saying, I believe I was like either the seventh or the ninth in American League history to accomplish that feat. Yeah, how exciting, yeah. Well, you played from the Royals from 1988 to 1999. Who was your favorite coach and teammates with the Royals? Gosh, favorite coach? Uh, probably Bruce Keeson got the most out of me. Um, he was our pitching coach, and he didn't. I didn't need a lot of mechanical tweaking. I uh, had another coach in Guy Hansen who was really good with regards to mechanics. But Bruce Keeson was a guy that was more a philosophical type coach and uh, seemed to help me a lot along that line as far as being tough and, and being the type of pitcher that uh, you have to be. Um, so those those two coaches probably stand out as much as anybody that uh, you know that I can think of. Mm-hmm. What about players? Favorite, favorite teammates? Probably my favorite teammate would have been Mark Gubiza. And uh, Gooby being a starting pitcher, had a lot of downtime, and just a really fun guy to have. And he kind of taught me the ropes. He's a uh, he was in the big leagues a little earlier than me. Uh, he's actually a little younger than I am, but he um, he helped me a lot as far as transitioning uh, to be a, a royal, really, and, and taught me the ropes and gave me uh, the experience on what it's like to be a major league player and, and how you pass that down and how guys like George Brett taught him and you know some of the, the veteran pitchers that had schooled him on how to be a, a, a major leaguer and particularly – how to be a Kansas City Royal. So Mark Gubiza, probably one of the most influential guys for me and one of my favorite teammates. Okay. Well, what Royals game are you most proud of your contributions to the team? None really stand out. People have asked yeah. me that a number of times. You know, what's what was your biggest moment? And, and I, I really don't have any. Okay. I, I, I don't have any particular games. I, I think I pitched in... Gosh, almost 700. I pitched in 700 games in my career, and the lion's share of those as a Royal. But uh, there are really none that, in my mind, stand out more than the than others. If I had to name one, it would probably be the last game of the '93 season. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went into that game uh, against the Texas Rangers, and ironically, it was the last game ever played in Old Arlington Stadium, mm-hmm. and George Brett's last game, uh, I believe. Uh, maybe as a Royal, uh, I can't remember for sure, but I remember uh, I got a save on that particular day and it uh, actually gave me the, tied me for the lead league and gave me the Roll Aids Relief Award for the 93 season. So if I had to say any particular game, that probably would stand out as, many, as much as any. Okay, all right. Well, tell us about playing in Kansas City for the crowds, the game highlights, and special historic moments. I, what I remember most is the first half of my career, really leading up to the 94-95 strike because uh, coming over in 88, there was still that, you know, that um, residual from winning the World Series in 85. You know, we, we put 40,000 in the seats every night and two and a half million people in the stands and you know, over two million every year. And um, it was like, you know, there, you were just automatic. You're gonna have a big electric crowd at then Royal Stadium, now Kauffman Stadium. And it just was a tremendous place. And the owner, Jorin Kaufman, um, he made sure the team was very competitive. And unfortunately at the time, there were only two divisions. So there were only going to be, you know, uh, and there were no wild cards. So it's very difficult to make the playoffs. But we were right in the hunt seemingly every year. Uh, and then a strike hit in 94, which that was actually going to be the first year for a wild card, uh, you know, birth for a team. And unfortunately, there were no playoffs, no World Series. But uh, we had a great team going into that. I remember we won something like 11 or 14 consecutive games at one point. Uh, and then the August 
maybe 12th or 24th or whenever it was in in the, in the 94 season baseball came to a, a halt and unfortunately I think Kansas City felt the effects of the strike as much as about any team in baseball because Ewing Kaufman had passed away in 93 and he left uh, a, a finite amount of money behind in order to fund the losses that the team was going to incur because even though we were competitive we lost money every year but Mr. Kaufman would personally fund that loss so he left money behind and there was going to be a fairly short timetable and that money was going to be gone and until they found a new uh, you know, successor owner for Mr. Kaufman uh, we had to cut corners and you cut corners and the payrolls is reduced and you go young and as a result the team really kind of went in the tanks and you know, it didn't win for a long time. It was a really a decade without winning baseball in Kansas City. So that was a real downtime, the second half of my career. But I, I remember the first half so well and just so much fun. And, again, every year, even though there were only two divisions and two teams to make the playoffs uh, in each league, uh, it was a lot of fun going to the ballpark. Well, tell us about something funny that's happened on the Royals team. Maybe a joke or a prank. Wow. Lots of those. Seemingly every night there was something. Um, Brett Saberhagen, he was he was a real prankster. If you weren't careful, you would be sitting on the bench, and next thing you know, you're you know, you're you're you got the hot foot. He's put a book of matches on fire on it. And uh, I remember one time we were getting our team picture, and I was I think it was my first year at the Royals, and and guys kept asking me if I had any gum. They'd say you got any gum on you? And I'm like, no, I don't have any gum. And uh, little did I know that Mark Gubas had taken a big wad of gum. And he put it on the bill of my cap, and when the team picture came out, it looked like some some bird had laid an egg on my on my hat. So uh, I did have gum on me, but not in the way that I thought. So just you know, a lot of a lot of things, and that's that's the beauty of baseball. You know, especially as a relief pitcher, you got pretty much you know a, a big part of the night to where you can really kind of be a fan, a fan, enjoy the game, have some fun, and and really not have to do a whole lot until you know it's time to get serious, and then. You know, when the phone rings and then you shift gears and, and, and all your focus is on the game. Well, this is Matt Starr, host of the Kansas City Sports History Group. We're going to stop for a break. Stay tuned for more. And our guest today is uh, Jeff Montgomery. Jeff, did you have any superstitions you followed while playing baseball? Not any that were what I would call superstitions, but I did have a routine. Uh, I felt like um, conditioning was a real big part of my game and I would go to the ballpark and it seemed like if I go and run at between 4 and 4 30 in the afternoon that would be the optimal time for me to uh, get the most out of my workout uh, my run and be able to recover in time to be able to pitch you know, in the seventh eighth or ninth inning and the times that I was not able to do that whether it be a travel situation or you know, just something going on personally that didn't allow me to do it. it didn't seem like I had to, you know, the, the the same quality of performance. So I guess that's superstitious, uh, but I think there's a lot of reasoning behind it as far as that. But uh, nothing as far as jumping over the line or stepping on the line. Uh, didn't sit in a certain place in a dugout. Didn't sit in a certain place in the bullpen. Didn't put my socks on in a particular order. Didn't wear, you know, the lucky shirt. But... Um, you know, creature of habit, like a lot of guys in baseball, but you do it every day, and you just kind of get in that routine. Right. Well, you played in the All-Star Games in 1992, 93, and 96. Tell us about your experience in the Midsummer Classic and representing the Kansas City Royals. Well, my first one was, was really special because I felt like once you're an All-Star, um, your teammates, your fans, and the players you play against every night – uh, on the other teams they look at you a little differently and I felt like that was almost like an arrival point and then uh, it gives you a tremendous amount of confidence in your abilities and, and what you can do as a player uh, so that, that one was special in that regard uh, the following year my 93 season in Baltimore it was really uh, probably my most special because I had the chance to pitch a, uh, I think I pitched in the seventh inning of the game and had a one two three inning and uh, we won the game, and uh, that was really a, a very cool experience. And it was in Baltimore, one of my favorite ballparks to, to, to play in, and my family was able to be there. The first year, it's like a whirlwind. Um, it was in San Diego, Jack Murphy Stadium, and just a lot going on, and I tried to accommodate everybody. I tried to, every media request, every 
every opportunity to do something, I did it. And by the time the game was over, I looked back and I was worn out. I didn't get a chance to spend much time with my family, my friends who had attended. But the next year in Baltimore, 93, I took a little more time to enjoy it. And I, and I still have probably the fondest memories of, of that All-Star game. And then 96 in Philadelphia, we got boat raced by the National League. Uh, Mike Piazza put on a show, and it was really not much of a game. I didn't get a pitch in the game, so it was really kind of a downer uh, for all those reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you won the 1993 Rolaids Relief Award for the best closer. Tell us about that year with 45 saves and the award. Yeah, you know, like I mentioned a little earlier, I had a chance to win the award in the last game of the season. And, um, I, I really didn't have to pitch, and I was going to win the award because the Toronto Blue Jays had played earlier in the day, and Dwayne Ward, who was the closer for the Blue Jays, who um, had 45 saves already, but I had more Rolaids points than he did. I, I didn't even have to pitch, and I still won. And I, if I would have pitched and I would have blown the save, I would have lost the points, <laughs> the point lead. So, uh, But they asked me if I wanted to pitch. I said, yeah, I want to pitch, and I pitched and had a 1-2-3 inning. I remember Juan Gonzalez grounded out for the – Final out of the game, last out ever in Arlington Stadium. And uh, I'll never forget this. I was going off the field after the, the, the last out, and I asked the first baseman for the ball. And he said, well, I gave it to the umpire. The umpire is Al Clark. And he said, uh, Al Clark has it. Well, in the old Arlington Stadium, you walk down the tunnel you know, behind home plate to get to the clubhouse. And sure enough, the umpire is walking. I asked Al Clark, I said, can I have that baseball? And he goes, well, I'm going to keep it. He goes, that's the last out ever here in Arlington Stadium. I said, well, I'd really like to have it because – you know, I just won the Rolades Award, and it was, it was, I'd like to give it to my dad. And he, sure enough, gave, the, gave me the baseball, okay. and uh, I did give it to my dad. And uh, like all of my first save ball, my 100th save ball, my 45th save ball, my 300th save ball, I, I gave my dad all of the baseballs, uh, you know, every year. So he collected all the balls for me. So, uh, you know, just a, a lot of fun. That was a real special year. That was, you know, again, that was a year that we were um, – you know, in the hunt till you know, sometime in the last month of the season. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, on June 20th, 1996, you saved a 239th game of your career to pass Dan Quisenberry and set a Royals team record, helping the Royals to beat the White Sox 5-3 to three in 10 innings. Tell us about that event. Yeah, it was um, when I was, you know, getting saves, you know, at the time, it was hard to get, you know, 35 or 45 saves in a season because you would pitch seventh inning, eighth inning, ninth inning. It's more than a one inning job, and it was hard to pile up a bunch of saves. And you know, obviously, you have to stay healthy and you have to stay with the same team. And fortunately, I was able to accomplish both of those uh, feats. And as a result, just pure numbers add up and add up and add up. And over time, uh, the opportunity to, to 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 reach that milestone. And uh, I've always said that you know, Dan Quisenberry, in my opinion will always go down as the greatest relief pitcher in Royals history until Greg Holland wins a World Series or somebody else comes along and you know surpasses his mark as far as longevity and uh, all the things you know that he did and then also wins a World Series he will go down to me as a, as, as a top reliever in Royals history regardless of the fact that I did surpass the amount of saves that he got uh, 239 was a special number and I, I never would have thought it was possible uh, when you're getting you know, 18 or 20 saves a season. You know, that means you got to play for a long time. And well, fortunately, I was able to do that. And uh, but again, he's uh, in my mind always going to be at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Did you have any kind of uh, sports nicknames? No, not necessarily. Uh, you know, a lot of people call me Monty. Uh, people call me Blackjack, Number 21. Uh, okay. So, you know, nothing really particular as far as sports concern. I, I do remember Mark Ubaza who who he had a lot of names for everybody. And on my first spring training camp, um, he's, he's called me Top Gun. And uh, I was I was confused. I said, what, what's the deal? And he goes, well, you look like Tom Cruise. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I took that as a compliment. And, uh, you know, eventually, you know, that kind of wore off. But that was, you know, his first impression of me when I was in Major League Spring Training Camp in 1988. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Uh, tell us about your favorite pitches to throw. Yeah, it's a pretty easy one. I mean, my favorite pitch has always been a strike. You know, there's, uh, there's nothing like a strike. Uh, I threw four varieties, fastball, curveball, changeup, and slider, but uh, it's always pretty immediate for me. My favorite pitch is a strike. And uh, how you get that really doesn't matter. But, um, you know, my forte was variety and the ability to throw all four pitches and, you know, any count. That was a key to me being successful at the highest level. But, you know, nothing spectacular. I'd say if I had one pitch – 
that was my go-to pitch would have been my slider, in uh, particularly right-handed batters. But uh, you know, you have to learn over over some period of time that at some point you got to throw more than one pitch, and that was what uh, I was able to do to round me out and become a more complete pitcher. Mm -hmm. Were there any players you seemed to be more successful in pitching against? Yeah, it seemed like the big power-hitting right-handed batters, I was always successful against them. Uh, and I know at one point, like Joe Carter, for example, who was an RBI machine, uh, I think he was like 0 for 21 or 0 for 20 something. And then unfortunately, uh, he did hit a couple home runs, um, you know, later in, in our careers against each other. Uh, but, you know, guys like that, it seemed like I did really well against. I had the ability to, you know, expand the strike zone and, and make pitches, you know, that weren't going to be strikes look like strikes and, and get them to swing and pop them up and miss them and whatever it might be. But uh, those big right-handed batters were the, you know, they were the guys that I had most success against. Okay. All right. Great. Well, we talked about the uh, your number 21, the significance of that. Uh, being blackjack or yeah there's really no significance to the number it was what was issued to me oh, okay. uh, I was number 40 when I was with the Reds and I had hoped to be number 40 when I came to the Royals and Bud Black was number 40 okay. so uh, that number was taken and there was a number 21 hanging on my locker and it ironically was uh, my anniversary day I was anniversary was on January 21st so I thought you know that'll be a good reminder okay. for me that uh, I can never forget my anniversary yeah yeah well, tell us about being inducted to the Kansas City Royals Hall of Fame and what you're most proud of. Yeah, that, that probably would be the, I guess, the crowning moment for me when uh, you're recognized by, you know, the peers in your organization and people in the Royals Hall of Fame uh, as being worthy of having your, you know, your plaque out in their special building. And, um, you know, it's just a lot of, uh, you know, it's just a, a, a lot went into it. You know, starting when I was a kid playing in a playground down the street from my house in southern Ohio and uh, going through the ranks and you know a lot of times you hear people say that baseball has been very very good to me and baseball really has been very very good to me and uh, when I was recognized as a Royals Hall of Famer it, it, it you know it kind of you know put the finishing touches on and um, you know it's a very proud moment um, I'll never forget it uh, fortunately it was in 2003 when the Royals had their magical season the first winning season yeah. since the strike and the uh, house was packed, and, you know, it's just uh, a, a very proud moment. Family, friends, old coaches, you know, had a lot of people who had come into town to, to be part of it, and I just felt very proud. Yeah, that's great. Well, tell us about the best team you played with on the Royals. I think the 89 team. I think we won 92, 93 games. Um, you know, we just, uh, you know, we were a team that, you know, unfortunately, the Oakland A's were, uh, you know, in their heyday, and you know they were really good. But I think I, I believe the year was ninety, it was eighty nine, and um, you know we just we were stacked. That was still, you know, George Brett was a guy that, you know, put him in a situation where he can win a game for you, and he's going to do it most of the time. And mm -hmm. uh, Brett Saberhagen was the uh, American League Cy Young Award winner. Uh, but you know, another team that was really good was that team I mentioned earlier, right before the strike in ninety four. Uh, we had David Cohn and Kevin Apier and had rookie of the year Bob Hamlin on the oh, team. Yeah. And, you know, we were just a really solid team. And we were on the rise. Uh, our pitching staff was very, very good. Our bullpen was great. Um, you know, we just had a lot of, you know, quality guys on the on that team. And I felt like we would have probably done some damage um, in a postseason that year if it had not been for the strike. Yeah. Well, you were the first pitcher in history to record uh, 300 career saves with one team. Tell us about that milestone. Yeah, I, uh, you know, had opportunities to leave a couple of times as a free agent, and I, at the time, I had you know two hundred plus saves, and you know three hundred is a milestone, and in fact, they honor you with a special three hundred save trophy. Okay. So I, you know, that was something that you always like to have these these goals or these things that you shoot for, and that was certainly one of them. And uh, I was aware of the fact that no one had ever done it with one team, and um, you know that was going to be something that uh, you know was going to be you know, would have meant a lot to me. Unfortunately, that happened. Uh, it's ironic. I had a chance to visit with Mariano Rivera uh -huh. uh, a few seasons ago, and uh, I mean, a lot of people probably remember the day that he hurt his knee in Kauffman Stadium. He was going to retire after that season, which would have been, the, gosh, I think the 2012 season, and um, he ends up hurting his knee. Well, be probably 25 minutes before he hurt his knee during batting practice, I was talking to him in the, in the Yankees clubhouse here uh, in Kansas City, 
and I reminded him of the fact that I was the first player to get 300 with one team, and he said, yeah, but I'm the first to get 600 with one team. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he was a very, very, uh, you know, elite, elite athlete, person, closer, you name it, just a very special guy. I was glad to see him come back uh, the next season and go out in style. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, tell us about your favorite events you broadcasted for the Kansas City Royals. It has to be the World Series last year. Yeah. Um, I've, I've told people a number of times that, um, you know, spending 12 seasons in a Royals uniform, uh, a lot of very proud moments. You know, you look at the back of your baseball card and you can be proud of what you were able to, you know, uh, put together as far as your personal resume. Uh, and I remember before Game 7, I was uh, doing a radio interview and I said that there would be nothing that would make me more proud to be a Royal than for the Royals to win this game tonight. Game seven of the World Series. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Uh, but still, being part of that World Series run, uh, even though as as a broadcaster, still my proudest moment as a Royal. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah the right. The Royals wrote a new chapter in Kansas City sports history in 2014. Give us your thoughts about the incredible season of the Royals from the regular season to the absolutely incredible postseason that is a uh, joy ride. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll describe it in one word, uh, improbable, because you have to have a lot of things happen in order to accomplish what they accomplished. The biggest accomplishment to me was coming back in a wild card game, because had they not done that, we wouldn't be talking about they were 90 feet away from tying game seven and, and, and going into extra innings and prob- probably winning the World Series. Uh, so it was an improbable win. You got John Lester on the mound. It's the eighth end of the game. He's got a big lead, and the Royals had already lost three games to the Lester during the course of the 2014 season. So it didn't look very good. But uh, fortunately, as we know, they came back in one of the all-time great games in baseball, not just Royals history, but baseball history, and uh, they win that game. So it was improbable uh, as it was. Uh, they were able to pull it off. And I think that game, it just gave the – you know, everybody in the organization, starting with the players, you know, the coaches and manager, people in the stands, people all over, you know, Kansas City baseball, it, there was this just huge uh, air of confidence, and it, and it carried through. And we saw them, you know, win eight consecutive postseason games and, uh, you know, do something very, very special. I just uh, can't imagine what it would have been like if they would have won the thing, but it was certainly a spectacular ride. Right, right. Well, give us your thoughts on the future of the 2015 Kansas City Royals and beyond. Well, I think coming into the season, the, the experience of particularly the younger players gained uh, from last season's postseason run should provide to be very beneficial uh, as far as them moving forward. They have a good core of young players uh, that filled in some of the blanks with some new players uh, through either trade or free agency. And uh, I just look for them to, to be very competitive. Uh, you know, every team in baseball during the course of the season, you play such a, a large amount of games over a six-month period. You know, every team in baseball gets hot during some stretch of the period. Uh, you know, during the season, and it could be a, a you know a, a last-place team. You're going to see them win, you know, 12 out of 14 games and get hot. I just hope that they're able to do exactly what they did last year and get hot again at the right time and 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 make it a habit of going uh, deep into the postseason and hopefully someday soon winning a World Series. Right. Well, Jeff, what's your favorite barbecue restaurant in Kansas City? I like uh, Jack Stack probably is my favorite. Um, I know some of the people who are involved in, uh, in, in running the uh, organization, and it's close by my house, at least the one in Martin City. So probably Jack Stack's the one that uh, we frequent more than others. But we like them all. I mean, the guys, it's hard to, hard to go wrong with any of them. Uh, in fact, you're making me hungry just asking that question. <laughs> Now, do you have any other sports history comments before we wrap up this session tonight? No, it's just that I, I, I didn't realize how good of a sports town uh, Kansas City was. When you grow up in a, in a part of the country like I did in Ohio, you've got the, to me, I always had the Reds and the Bengals. And, uh, you know, when I was traded to the Royals, I really didn't know much about uh, Royals, didn't know much about Kansas City, had never been to Kansas City. And, um, I learned very quickly that uh, there's a lot of uh, very rich history and tradition uh, here in Kansas City, and I, you know, I, I learned that there are special players and um, you know uh, 
stories behind a lot of the players like the Frank Whites and the Willie Wilsons and the George Bretts and you know just all that long list of Royals players and uh, became a chief season ticket holder shortly after becoming a Kansas City um, full-time resident. Um, my wife and I spent a couple years kind of commuting back in the winter and the summer uh, between seasons between Ohio and Kansas City and then after just a few short years we decided that uh, we're gonna make Kansas City home and we've been here now almost you know for gosh over two decades and um, it's been great to see our kids uh, go through school here in Kansas City and you know this will always be home to us so it's it was really a nice um, opportunity for us to get you know the experience as an athlete in the city and now as, a, as an alum uh, experiencing you know what's going on with both the Royals and all the teams in Kansas City and, and to be part of it and I'm so fortunate to be involved with Sports Radio 810 because it really kind of rounds out you know the entire you know kind of sports spectrum yeah. you know depending on what time of year it is and you know we have players coming in for interviews and shows and, and being part of that it's been a, a, a real you know joy ride for me. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed this Kansas City Sports History Podcast. That's it for today. This is your host, Matt Starr, signing off. Check back for more Kansas City Sports History interviews and podcasts to come.